Okay. Uh, hey, Max is my nephew, by the way. Oh, he is. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm his uncle. Hey, nep nephew of Craig, Max. You didn't tell me that. <laughs> He's keeping it on the download. Keeping it on. The I, I have a feeling I, I I didn't want to bring it up unless I had to. Nephew yeah, to the rescue. Yeah, it I, it hey, too relevant. If I if I were related, especially by blood to Craig, I would also keep that on the download. <laughs> um, well, he's one hey, of my better uncles, so. <laughs> that is, I I am a hundred percent positive of that. Yeah, Craig would be like the the. Uh, the Ur uncle, you know, he's like, uh, yeah, perfect uncle Craig. I was good um, when, I, when they were little. So when they were, he, was, he was little. Corrupting you from a young age, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, quick question. Uh, I didn't ask the panelists if they were okay with recording it. Uh, so I figure I should ask them. Are you guys okay with that, Daniel and Anaya? No, it's fine. Okay. It's fine with me. This way I can watch it if I have to leave. So I appreciate that. Ananya, right? Ananya. Yeah, hi. Hi. And Ananya. I just wanted to uh, tell Craig that I'm a big fan of your long emails. I mean, every day I'm literally waking up reading your emails, which are like <laughs> full of all the details. And I appreciate it. Yeah, they're really good. Well, thank you. That's very nice of you to say. I think my jokes maybe um, have become like real dad They jokes. are amazing. Yeah. No, no, no. Well, <laughs> well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. It's nice to hear because for every one of the a comment like that, I hear um, probably about two that say your emails are far too long. Yeah, and they're both from me. <laughs> both of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay, they're almost gonna... like long letters. So they're fascinating. Uh, okay, I'm going to come right back, but I have to, sure. I'm going to take a break, but okay. have a good session. Okay, thanks, Craig. Yeah. See ya. Bye. Hi, Emma. I don't think I've ever met you in person, but I know I, I, I'm a Facebook friend of yours. I actually, I'm, I may not be, but I see you comment. You make witty comments on Craig's insane Facebook posts all the time. And I like them. So, it's, hey, it's me. Uh, I think I may have met you briefly at, um, it was a few years ago when they did, when there was a presentation about evil and Craig. Oh yeah, there. that's right. Yeah. That was a DeFi event too. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Great. Hey, so where are you guys, Emma? You're, are you in Denver? No, I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee. That's where my um, program is. Okay. And and Anandia, you're sorry, I, bad. I live on a high traffic road, but um, hopefully we won't have any ambulance or fire trucks, which is a common theme. Uh, Anandia, you're in. I'm in India West, right now. West Bengal, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Cool. I spent a fair amount of time in West Bengal, actually. Really? So. When? Um, probably before you were born, maybe in the late nineties. Uh, I, I, um, I was born. You were okay. Well, uh, I, I, my first degree is in South Asian studies and I did a master's degree in South Asia in, in like Sanskrit, medieval Sanskrit literature. Okay. And, um, That's so I lived crazy. off and on in India for about five or six years of my life. And I, I oh, love wow. India, but haven't, so, haven't been back now in probably eight years, I think. Okay. You should come again. Oh, I would love to. Yeah, that it's it's on my short list. Mm -hmm. um, so where did you live in West Bengal? Like, uh, um, I spent Canada. time in Calcutta. Um, I a fair amount of time there. I spent a lot of time actually in Darjeeling and in the towns around Darjeeling, mm -hmm. uh, little mountain towns. I had a friend who was a, a Vajrayana Buddhist up there who okay. I met actually at a monastery in um, uh, in uh, Bodh Gaya. And mm -hmm. uh, and then I spent a lot of time in Sikkim, which I realize isn't technically West Bengal and culturally very different, but yeah, that's right. Yeah, wow, I didn't even know about this coincidence. This you know, connection. <laughs> when I saw your paper, I'm like, oh, look at that! It's amazing that you're writing about funny games. Uh -huh. I'm really excited to hear about that. And Daniel, how about yourself? Where are you uh, joining us from? I'm on the east coast of China. I'm in Zhejiang east coast province. Of China. Yeah, I'm in Wenzhou. Oh wow! How long have you been there? Uh, this is my fourth year. I'm teaching at a, a higher ed Sino foreign university, uh, English language school. Wow, super cool. So what's the closest city that I would know that I would know? <laughs> I was going to say no well, but I only I know Shanghai and I've been to Hong Kong a couple of times, but what about Hangzhou? Do you know Hangzhou? You know, I yeah, I've, I Hangzhou is a big university town, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, there's a big university there, a Chinese university. Um, other than that, the closest place would be, well, Shanghai is like six hours away by okay. high-speed rail. 
So okay. we're, we're pretty far out here. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Well, that's cool. We have a truly international conference. I'm in the least interesting place, I'm afraid. Where are you? I'm in Denver, Colorado. Oh, okay. And that's Craig and I are colleagues. I'm in the philosophy department and he's in the English department here. So, oh, it looks like we have Natalie here. Natalie, welcome. I can't. Um... Oh, there you go. Okay. There you are. Hi. hi. I'm sorry, I went into the wrong uh, session. Um, it's funny, apologies. I walk into more wrong rooms via Zoom than I do in real life, for sure. <laughs> All right. Yeah, since everyone's here, I, I'm probably going to go. If you need to get hold of me or Gabriel or uh, Craig, you can message Justin Hoover if anything, if there's any issues. But I'm assuming you guys will be fine. So. Great. Thank you right. very much. Appreciate it, Max. Great session. Great. Thanks, Max. Appreciate it. So yeah, it looks like we also have some some guests with us too, and we're. I, Natalie, are you okay with uh, us recording the session? Of course, I am. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Definitely. And where are you joining us from? Uh, from LA. From. Uh, oh, okay. Yes. It's, it's been very hot. <laughs> oh, has it? And, okay. and usually hot for November. Yeah, yeah. We've. I mean, Denver oftentimes gets snow as early as September, and it's been um, pretty warm and dry here as well. But, um, great. Well. I think it's 7.03, we, 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 we're missing one of our panelists who can't make it today, uh, Gavin Farrow. Um, and um, yeah, and so that means that we do have a little bit more, just a little bit more time. I'm gonna still try to keep everybody honest in terms of presentation times. I think, did we, uh, are we all shooting kind of between 15, 15 to 18, 20 minutes, something in that zone? Okay, I'll, I, would you guys mind if I give you some kind of a, a flag, let me see if I can put my hand up or something. Is there a way I can put my hand up? I was thinking that- um, There is that a raise hand option under reactions. Under reactions, oh, there it is, great. So yeah, so why don't I do this? If I, in fact, I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a thumbs up when you have um, only a certain, uh, when you have like, let's say, when you're at 16 minutes. But now I don't know how to get rid of my thumbs up. Uh, you have to press it once more. Press it again? Is that all? Yeah, I guess. Uh, oh, now it looks like I've got it twice. Isn't that weird? I think it goes away with time. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, well, anyways, I'll, okay, so I'll, I'll give you some kind of a signal. Yeah, you're right. It does go away with time. Yeah. Uh, it's a little delay. So I will, thanks, Emma. I will give you guys a little signal when you hit, let's say, 17 minutes. If you hit 17 minutes, at which point, you know, just try to, kind of finish up but um yeah but i think that that will will save the conversation i guess because it's only three panel three discuss three uh presentations so i think it won't be that I, I generally prefer doing you know presentation followed by questions presentation especially when you have four presentations because you can't remember the first presentation by the end but i think um considering that it's a little bit shorter present you know panel than we had initially um planned i think that that uh, procedure will work just fine. So, um, great. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to say a few words real quickly, just because when we edit this video, we'll put it up on uh, a page that uh, that a humanity center that I run has. Um, so I'm just going to kind of start in a formal kind of way, if that's okay, uh, for the editing purposes. Um, well, thank you everybody for joining us. I really appreciate it. We've got a really exciting panel on film and philosophy here for you tonight uh, for this se uh, session of PAMLA, which is also co-sponsored by DeFi, which is the Denver Project for Humanistic Inquiry. It's a public humanities center sponsored by MSU Denver here in Denver, Colorado. And uh, my name is Adam Graves. I'm the director of that program and a, a professor in the philosophy department there, a colleague of, of Craig, who's over in English, of course. Uh, so yeah, so I'm really excited about this, about this session. We have uh, three presenters, uh, each of which uh, is presenting on a, a really a great, uh, a great director. I mean, these are some of the, 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 the three best, greatest directors of all time in terms of, uh, for those of us who enjoy, uh, I don't know, challenging art house uh, auteur type film. Uh, so let's just begin. I guess Ananya uh, Sasaru is going to go first. Uh, Ananya received her BA uh, in English literature from 
Batoon College in India and completed her MA in English Literature and MPhil in English Literature from the University of Calcutta. Uh, currently, she is in her second uh, year uh, of her PhD program in the Department of English at the University of Calcutta. She teaches in various uh, uh, teaches in various subjects. Uh, Sorry, I've got I've got some uh, scramble in my in my uh, it's here. UG and PG uh, courses. Yeah, that's what okay, I mean. Okay, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, undergrad and postgrad courses uh, as a visiting lecturer. Her area of academic interest includes film studies, um, NBSP, gender studies, architecture, uh, architectural philosophy, and critical theory. So thank you so much, Ananya. Looking forward to uh, her talk, which is titled. An Uncanny Blurring of Boundaries, Home, host, Hostage, and Hospitality in Michael Haneke's Funny Games. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Adam, for your introduction. So I have a PPT. I'm going to share my slide. Uh, and just let me know if it is uh, visible to all of you. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, so the title of my paper is An Uncanny Blurring of Boundaries, Horror, Hostage, and Hospitality in Michael Haneke's Funny Games. And although I'm focusing on funny games, I will be referring to other films here and there. Now, when we talk about uh, hospitality, it uh, primarily refers to uh, varied uh, images of otherness, for example, a foreigner, a stranger, an exile, or a nomad. And... Uh, to put it simply, it's basically the act of welcoming the other into our private sphere of the home or house and also into the public sphere of the nation or the society. Now, um, against the Western concept of hospitality, which is uh, mostly uh, uh, conditional, uh, Jacques Derrida talks about this unconditional or absolute hospitality, which is basically the... Um, sort of unquestioning offering to the other without any expectation, reciprocity, without any kind of um, pressure or obligation. But I'll come to that later. Uh, so I would like to start with uh, the etymology of uh, hospitality. The words hospitality and hostility, although opposite in meaning, share the same origin. Emphasizing the ambivalent nature of hospitality, which is never completely open and thus is inextricably linked with the possibility of violence, Derrida creates the concept of hospitality. At this point, he refers to an ambiguous Latin word, hostis, which means both a guest and an enemy. Depending on how we want to receive an arriving stranger, an alien, a foreigner. Hospitality is derived from the Latin word hospice, which is formed from two words, hostess and pets. So hostess originally meant foreigner and later it came to mean a hostile foreigner. And pets means to have power. So the literal meaning of hostess is the lord of strangers. Being a host means having power over guests and hostess does refers to both the inviting master and the invited guests. So uh, here also on the screen, as you can see, we have uh, this uh, different words, hosty, hostimentum, uh, I'm not sure if I'm getting the French pronunciation correct, so pardon that. Hosta, hostess, hostile, and so on, which are kind of uh, tied up in this array of paradoxical knot, where the single word can mean receiving and giving friend, enemy. So it kind of problematizes the fixed boundaries that separates these words. So I would refer to uh, this film by Michael Haneke, uh, Time of the Wolf which came out in 2003 and it's a post-apocalyptic film which starts with a family of four uh, who are kind of escaping from this uh, unknown ecological catastrophe and they come to their vacation home only to find that it was already occupied by a set of threatening strangers. So this uh, very idea of home which is supposed to be a safe place and a place of comfort is suddenly disrupted, it suddenly turns upside down as George, who is uh, the father of the family, the so-called master of the house, he offers a gesture of hospitality and that is immediately answered by a gunshot. He is killed and the entire family is thrown outside in the cold without anything to support their life. Uh, so this deterritorialization of the home, which Freud would perhaps call the uncanny 
continues uh, not only in this film but also in many films and we'll see this lack of empathy lack of uh, kindness and a very deep humanitarian crisis um and the idea of hospitality in this film is very much conditional because there are a lot of exchanges going on in terms of sexual favors and where they are just you know receiving the basic amenities like food clothing and shelter only when they're parting with their uh, you know so called important things and another film uh, which is also highly uh, acclaimed hidden or cash came out in 2005 uh, which opens with this uh, scene where they show the house of the protagonist for a long period of time and it's only after uh, several minutes that we understand that it's basically a video tape which is capturing the house that will be eventually sent to their homes so again we have a series of video tapes and children's drawing and unknown phone calls which play throughout the film and the protagonist who is again named george now this is the thing about michael haneke films all the protagonist couples they are called george and and or anna so uh, george uh, is very much threatened and he immediately tries to hunt down uh, the unknown sender or the invader and in one of the interview michael haneke said that cash may be about the french occupation of algeria on a broad level but more personally it is the story of guilt and the denial of guilt that faces every one of us so george immediately suspects maji who was adopted by his parents after the paris massacre who is an algerian uh, man so george's hostility towards majid arrives partly from this guilt of having wronged him in childhood it is not because majid is a foreigner by birth because if that would have been the case then uh, george would not have been so compassionate about the paris massacre and the algerian plight his hostility towards majid is rooted more uh in a fundamental and basic problem that is he's protecting his domain his home which he needs for him to possess the power of hospitality so in each of these varied ways these examples show how the presence of the invader within a domestic setting disrupts boundaries the normative understandings of home are problematized the unhemlish atmosphere that is engendered by this unwelcome presence breaks down conventional categorizations of the internal and external as well as that of the family unit itself michael haneke's ongoing exploration of the various domains of hostility and violence can be traced back to the austria's particular relationship to the events before and after second world war especially the warm embrace of the nazi party and justification that follows as haneke himself said and i quote in austria today you still hear people proclaim that none of us were nazis no one will admit to being a nazi they were all victims of nazi unquote thus the psychological scars of the suffering and the refusal to confront the compromised past is very much evident in the works of haneke who believes that all of us are capable of being a part of the violent world and we have always already been uh, consuming violence through various technological modes even if unwittingly so this is also one of the reasons why michael haneke uh, decided to remake funny games we know that there were two versions one came out in 1997 which is the uh, austrian or the german version and the other one came out in the us in 2007 so both these versions uh, they share almost identical dialogue and the only significant difference between them uh, reside in casting setting and the context in which they came out known for his experiments with narrative and his fervent disavowal of hollywood conventions haneke invites viewers to enter the narrative space of the film in order to critique america's desire for violence and he represents the domestic space in the film to show how violence not only intrudes on the home but is in fact embedded in our very understanding of domesticity um so when this film came out it was during a time when public support for the wars in iraq and afghanistan began to wane and americans were growing increasingly wary of what they perceived to be government's intrusion on privacy in the name of homeland security through the film haneke divides a subtle critique of a culture that in its desire to prevent a cult of american exceptionalism through the rhetorical trope of the house unknowingly opens itself to political violence from within and without 
when it was released in uh, 1997, it was Michael Haneke's outspoken intention to critique the endless uh, consumption of violent films by the Western audience. And he says this in another interview, when I first envisioned funny games in the mid 1990s, it was my intention to have an American audience watch the movie. It is a reaction to a certain American cinema, its violence, its naivety, the way American cinema toys with human beings. In many American films, violence is made consumable. But because I made funny games in German with actors not familiar to US audiences, it didn't get through to the people who most needed to see it. Uh, so following this, I would quickly just uh, like to talk about the two types of hospitality because that's what I intend to read in uh, funny games. So Jacques Derrida talks about the conditional hospitality and the unconditional or the absolute hospitality, drawing from Levinas, who had also talked about the same thing. So uh, conditional hospitality, as I mentioned earlier, is more about the uh, hospitality, which has a lot to do with facts and rights and laws. And the unconditional hospitality is where you open up your home without asking a question, not even the name or force the person to speak your own language. But paradoxically, again, uh, the unconditional hospitality leads to a kind of violence that disrupts the space of the house where the master becomes the guest and the guest becomes the master, as we can see in uh, many films of Michael Haneke, including Funny Games and Time of the Wolf. Um, so the film, Funny Games, and these are the clippings from the Funny Games, shows the importance of absolute hospitality, telling the story of a family who take two young men, Peter and Paul, under their roof. On the surface, the guests are cultured and well-mannered. They use polite forms, yet in their numerous requests to the host, they progress further and finally go beyond all bounds of decency. As guests, they take complete control not only over the house, but also over the fate of the terrorized residents, whom they bully physically and mentally. In Haneke's film, the powerless, defenseless hosts who are held hostage by their guests. The roles are reversed, and it is now the host who turns out to be the guest in their own house, which at this point no longer belongs to them. Um, technology plays an important role in Haneke's films, TV, videotapes, phone, camera, etc. In Seventh Continent, the TV goes on even when the family has collectively committed suicide. In Cash, the conflict between the French and the Algerians are played in a loop on the television as the family suffers invasion from an unknown entity uh, to their space. In an interview for the journal Positive, Haneke explains that he has been witness to the television's invasion of the domestic space and its hijacking of the cinema's unique pleasures. I'm most concerned with television in society I'm most concerned with television as the key symbol primarily of the media representation of violence and more generally of a greater crisis, which I see as our collective loss of reality and societal disorientation. Alienation is a very complex problem, but television is certainly implicated in it. And in this regard, we also have Jacques Derrida writing in ethnographies. Already, I have the impression that our control is very limited. I'm at home. But with all these machines and all these processes, watching, surrounding, seducing us, the quote, natural conditions of expression, discussion, reflection, deliberation are to a large extent breached, falsified, and warped. So in other words, the fear of the other is not just fear of the other, but it's the fear of an entire network and apparatus of technology that does violence to our sense of home and our sense of self. It is a situation of my home where communication and technology in the form of surveillance interrupts my sense of home and makes me feel not at home. In funny games, the various uh, technological tropes include the music system, the automatic gate, the cell phone, and above all the television. The home is increasingly armored by technology as the family insinuates themselves from the world with their money. The gate that is meant to protect the family is shown to be the cause of their difficulty to escape. The phone is out of order. The golf clubs and expensive knives purchased as status symbols are used to injure them. Their boats provide a getaway for the villains. 
The television, meant for entertainment, soon paves way to a series of violent, sadistic murder games played upon the hostages by Peter and Paul. And unlike the conventional mechanism of a television, here the remote is under the control of the guests who can even rewind the actions. Paul reverses the time to prevent the murder of his partner, Peter. It is as if he gets to decide how the film ends. Disrupting the linearity, the whole narrative of the film is now under his control and everyone else is rendered powerless. He makes the rules, others abide by it. There is no choice, heads and tails both cater to the same result here. The dichotomy is thus reversed. You are no longer the master of the house, even though the boys ironically refer to him as the captain. Your rules no longer work on anybody and you have no control even on the gates and doors uh, and on the TV, uh, which is inside the house. So these group of people, they become strangers in their own house and the earlier guests, they become more and more comfortable in their personal space. With little Georgie's mother and the splintering of his blood on the TV screen completes the violent imagery that prevails throughout the film. Leaving much of the brutality against bodies off screen, Haneke draws our attention to the borders of the image and the limits of our visibility. The film's refusal to reveal the most disturbing images or voyeuristic gazes into its borders mirrors the house's own attempt to wall out that which would cause us harm. When the men force Anna to undress, they cover George's eyes with a pillowcase and the spectators are also blocked from seeing her naked body as the camera frames are only from shoulders up. And finally, uh, I would just like to comment on uh, this very interesting part where Haneke almost breaks the fourth wall and we have the characters directly looking at the camera and making conversation with us. So um, Haneke states that all the rules that exist to keep the society functioning are nothing to them. And here the boys, they exist outside the rules of the society and outside the film. When one of them questions, you think they stand a chance, you are on their side, aren't you? The audience is called to move between the digesis and the non digesis along with the killers, making us participants in the actions. Paul's gazes and declarations intrude beyond the confines of the frame, infiltrating past the fourth wall, brutally proving that there is no safety to be found on either side of the screen. His direct address to us in our own house, it becomes a kind of home invasion. Whether we are watching the film on a cinema screen or a television, we experience our own violence through the sudden address as the killers invade the realm of the audience. And finally, Michael Haneke, by making this film, becomes truly a master in his own uh, home. However, while brutally maintaining his authority over a film, he also believes that cinema as an art form should call on the imagination of the spectator to draw them into the project, to have them finish your film for you. After a Haneke film finishes on the screen, it continues in the cognition of the audience. This is where Haneke becomes a received host, and the viewer becomes the receiving host. The film enters their minds and now the spectator is the host and has power over it. They can interpret the film based on their own beliefs and understanding. If we consider this film as a host and the audience as a guest, we can perceive Haneke as the master of his house who toys with these expectations and manipulates the laws of hospitality. Yeah, thank you. I think I've exceeded the time. And I did not see um, Adam raising his hand because the grid was somehow not working on my- No, no actually you're, you, made it, you made it in on time, actually. Your timing was perfect. So no problems there. Thank you very much. That was a great paper. I'm looking forward to uh, discussing it. So. Um, our next speaker is Danny uh, Dyer. Is that, you're going to have to correct my pronunciation of your university, Danny. Um, he's a lecturer at the Wenzhou Kian University. Wenzhou Kane. Okay, thank you. Wenzhou Kane uh, Plus, University. Um, and his interests include religion, film, uh, and Scandinavian literature. He's speaking today, uh, the title of, of his paper is Sacred Trauma in Bergman's Trilogy of Faith. So thank you so much, Danny, for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, let me share my screen. OK, so I'll be reading part of a paper. And I have a PPT with images, hopefully, to break up the monotony. 
Uh, oops. Okay, can you guys see my PPT? Yep, yep, we can. Okay, cool. All right. So my presentation is called Sacred Trauma, Language and Recovery in Ingmar Bergman's Faith Trilogy. It's basically a Lacanian psychoanalysis of religious themes in Bergman. And there's a picture of Bergman there. That's not me. I'm Danny Dyer. All right. Yeah. So a few, few 20th century filmmakers concern themselves with spiritual angst more than Ingmar Bergman. Across Bergman's filmography, characters strive to rationalize religious belief with in The Seventh Seal, perhaps his most famous film, the knight Antonius Block returns from the Crusades to find himself locked in a chess game with death. Block speaks to death disguised as a priest when Block asks, why can't I kill God in me? Why does he live on in me in a humiliating way, despite me wanting to evict him from my heart? Subsequent, the magician, an acting troupe, finds a vagrant left to die in the wild. The vagrant reflects on his life. I've prayed one prayer in my life. Use me, O oh God, but he never understood what a devoted slave I'd have been. This sort of spiritual angst appears so often in Bergman's work that it's come to occupy much of the critical discussion, either as derision of the films or conjecture about Bergman's life and how his life inspired those themes. Uh, for example, more recently, critic Jonathan Rosenbaum accuses Bergman of trafficking in bitter and pinched emotions that, though chic, remain ugly ones, no matter how stylishly they might be served up. Biographer and apologist Marianne Hook, on the other hand, asserts that Bergman's production is intimately biographical, one big first-person narrative drama. Spiritual angst features prominently in Bergman's trilogy of faith, with films that include Through a Glass Darkly, Winter Light, and The Silence, and of course, critics have found connections between these films and Bergman's biography. Critics see in Through a Glass Darkly and Winterlight echoes of Bergman's agnosticism and troubled relationship with his father, who was an overbearing Lutheran pastor, whom Bergman would refer often to in interviews. And the silence, though denuded of religious themes, has likewise been the subject of biographical speculation, with critics observing Bergman's fascination with his female leads, like Liv Ullman and infatuation with death. <clears throat> Such attention to Bergman's life, however, tends to obscure elements that contribute to the, the trilogy's complexity. If the first two films explore Bergman's religious doubt, why should God appear as a monster, one that the characters continue to seek in prayer and ritual? And through a glass darkly, God's image proves devastating, a spider with a terrible stony face while Tomas in Winterlight also speaks of a spider god that appears to him as ugly and revolting. Bergman's treatment of God in Through a Glass Darkly in Winterlight is remarkably congruent with Old Testament depictions of Yahweh. Bergman's characters speak of God they find devastating and wait for God in empty rooms and churches, just as the scriptural prophets prostrate before the terrible power of the Lord. The God of the Israelites proves overwhelming, brutally powerful, yet a being to which they remain inextricably drawn. When Moses returns from Sinai with his tablets, his countenance holds Yahweh's radiance and terrifies the Israelites so that the prophet must veil his face. Ezekiel falls prostrate on seeing God's glory, while jo Job trembles before the Lord's might. I am insignificant, says Job. What can I reply to thee? In these passages, God presents a contradiction of revulsion and allure as a deity appealing and terrible, loving, apathetic, and wholly awful. Many psychoanalysts have considered the intersections between trauma and spirituality. Lacan would elaborate on trauma in his lectures on consciousness and signification, mostly in the 1960s. For Lacan, a child's mind begins as an array of fragmentary sensations, pleasure, pain, hunger, and fear. Yet through an encounter with a mirror, the child finds a false image of wholeness that constitutes the ego ideal. This image becomes encoded in a pre-existing network of symbols from which the child may draw signifiers to codify reality. 
Part of reality, however, stubbornly, stubbornly resists an expression and remains outside the network of images and symbols. That images and symbols can form consciousness depends on primordial signifiers used to compartmentalize these traumatic aspects of reality. As Lacan has it, master signifiers precede and usher discourse and make meaningful communication possible. But in prohibiting the traumatic aspect of reality, master signifiers like God create a trauma, the object petit a, the unattainable object, thereby motivating for it a dangerous desire. Since Lacan, many other psychoanalysts have considered how trauma's cycle of repression and reemergence mimics ritual and how traumatic stimuli, stimuli resembles the divine. In his book, God is a Trauma, Vicarious Religion and Soulmaking, psychoanalyst Greg Mogensen writes, to stand before an event for which we have no metaphors is to stand in the tabernacle of the Lord. Like Moses before the bush that burned and yet was not consumed, the soul falls down prostrate before whatever it is unable to relativize into images. For Lacan and Mogensen, traumatic stimuli prove traumatic in that they are inexpressible. The traumatized soul lacking adequate signifiers with which to mediate trauma deifies the trauma. Um, Bergman's trilogy, particularly the first and the last film, um, alongside their spiritual angst, express much doubt about human communication. And through A Glass Darkly, this doubt is exemplified in the film's frequent miscommunications and contradictions. For all the dialogue in the films, characters consistently fail to hold meaningful discourse. In Winterlight, such doubt about communication is addressed reflexively by those characters who find themselves unable to accomplish much with words. The suicidal parishioner, Jonas, admits that his anxiety stems from news of a rapidly militarizing China, but he can offer no elaboration, for to speak of it would be impossible. Like Jonas, Tomas mistrusts his own words. He laments to Marta, his lover, of the inadequacy of speech. He confesses, I could only spout drivel, yet I had the feeling that each word was decisive somehow. Jonas's and Tomas's reservations about communication find them without means of establishing meaningful human connections, just as David and Through a Glass Darkly resigns himself to his office. As if sensing a disparity between words and reality, these characters remove themselves from discourse and human connection. <clears throat> The silence, of course, continues this treatment of human communication in its absence of dialogue and tension between characters. Early drafts of the film's script reveal Bergman's labor to pare down the film's dialogue. As critics have noted, the film spares dialogue by indulging in long, lingering takes, relying heavily on images to stand in for words. Those lines of dialogue that do feature in the film are ineffectual, often overwhelmed by non-human sounds, such as running water, typewriting, sentimental music from a crackling transistor radio, or the wispy sigh of clothing against skin. Esther and Anna speak to each other in curt, perfunctory phrases, and Anna's communication is, with her son is characterized like their physical exchanges with detachment. Worse than silence, this sort of communication is the negative imprint of words the death of the word as signifier. The silence and its pessimism about communication insists on a distance between individuals unspannable with language. Though Bergman did seem to rely on images in the trilogy to replace his dialogue, these images do very little to express meaning. The facial close-up, of course, would become a trademark flourish in Bergman's filmography. Uh, it's particularly popular in films like Persona and Cries and Whispers. Um, but the intention for Bergman's close-up remains a close-ups remains a matter for debate. By the time of the trilogy, he had come to rely more on these close-ups than the monologues of earlier films like The Seventh Seal. In the trilogy, however, the human face proves ambiguous. Bergman's close-ups, rather than burying characters' internality, only muddle meaning with contradictions and conflations. 
In Through a Glass Darkly, and I have the image on the PPT. In Through a Glass Darkly, Karen wakes to a beam of light falling on her eye, um, perhaps an indication of the divine sight that draws her from her husband. But by the end of the film, it's apparent that Karen's visions are just symptoms of psychotic disorder. In Winterlight, Tomas faces the camera with a vapid expression as light from the window fills the frame. Waxing light, of course, is an old motif in Christian iconography, one associated with grace, transcendence, and epiphany. But given that this light immediately follows Tomas's realization that God does not exist, the light might just as well signify him awakening to atheism. Certainly, the light casting Tomas's face in darkness only undermines its association with divinity, as does the expression on his face. In the silence, a similar play of light features on Esther's face when she waits on her deathbed. Her face reveals nothing. There's no indication of conversion, divine intercession, or hope for her condition. The human face, like the light and the spoken word, simply fails to signify. This failure of words and images in the trilogy, of course, begs for a, re a reading with Lacan in mind. Trauma is apparent in Bergman's trilogy and the doggedness with which characters ritualize their suffering. Karen's fanatical psychosis illustrates a dislocation between the normal world, mediated by images and symbols, and the other world of trauma behind the wallpaper. In Winterlight, Tomas's stubborn atheism is the ascension of Yahweh over the improbable and private image of God on which his companionship with the other characters depends. And through a glass darkly, Karen prostrates before the choir of voices that herald the spider god that terrifies her. While Tomas continues in his role as a pastor, despite the presence of the spider god that appears to him in times of doubt. The silence as the anomaly in the trilogy works differently in dealing with trauma in that it depicts an extra symbolic wasteland. Anna, Esther, and Johan arrive in Tomoka where the people speak an unrecognizable language Anna attempts a connection with a waiter through a shallow sexual encounter, while Esther babbles manically to an incoherent bellhop. Isolation so symptomatic to trauma proves disastrous for recovery by estranging the individual further from language. <clears throat> Despite this difficulty with communication and isolation, however, there is some indication of hope for recovery. Lacan describes psychosis as a complete exclusion from discourse due to the absence of a necessary master signifier. Therefore, hope for Karen's recovery is faint as her condition arises not from a single traumatic event, but by a complete failure to exist within the symbolic orders. In David's case, however, his conversation with his son reveals hope. David insists on the importance of a love that he can't touch or name but which he likens to God. David's instruction that Minas should listen represents his reconciliation with language, the fabrication of a new master signifier by which discourse is once again possible. In Winter Light, Tomas's estrangement from discourse is made clear immediately following the epiphany in his chamber. Tomas ceases to exist in any practical sense, so estranged from discourse by trauma. However, Tomas's ensuing performance of the Eucharist at the end of the film indicates a movement toward recovery. In terms of the ritual's significance, the Eucharist represents a new pact with the symbolic and imaginary orders by the reconstruction of the master signifier, that is God. In terms of the silence, however, Esther's fate at the end offers little suggestion of hope. Esther, the academic with a history of trauma, lingers post-symbolically. Once skilled at letters and languages, Esther can no more communicate with the bellhop than she can with her sister, with whom her few interactions are either curt or inappropriately desirous. It's perhaps unsurprising then that the only other incestual relationship suggested in the trilogy occurs between Minas and Karen, instigated by the latter at the height of a psychotic episode. Perhaps due in part to Esther's psychosis, Esther finds no recovery, but instead dies alone in Tomoka. The culmination of the extreme isolation of the traumatized individual bereft of symbols with which to mediate trauma. 
Um, so in closing, as the Lacanian reading of the trilogy might suggest, the religious doubt exhibited in Bergman's films and in articulation go hand in hand. In their various depictions of God, the trilogy of faith might suggest that though we may abandon our temples and desecrate our altars in our quest to repress God, God's position in the human psyche persists only to return in times of sickness, death, and trauma. If nothing else, Bergman's trilogy emphasizes the importance of images and symbols. In a 1963 interview with Wiegold Sjoman, <laughs> Ingmar Bergman cites a passage from Per Ligerwitz's novel, The Death of Aharusis. Beyond the gods, beyond all that falsifies and coarsens the world of holiness, beyond all lies and distortion, all twisted divinities and all the abortions of human imagination, there must be something stupendous that is inaccessible to us, which by our very failure to capture it, demonstrates how inaccessible it is. Beyond all the sacred clutter, the holy thing itself must exist. Considering this revelation in light of the treatments of trauma, language, and God in his trilogy of faith, it's clear that the pursuit of the sacred, the inexpressible, preoccupied Ingmar Bergman. In questioning the values of images, narrative, and language, the films imply a limit to which reality may be adequately conveyed. That which exceeds this limit, call it the uncanny, the real, trauma, abjection, or God, exists beyond the sacred clutter of languages and images. In Through a Glass Darkly, Winter Light and the Silence, Bergman points out that the distinction between reality and subjectivity is irrelevant. Individuals should instead, instead strive for these moments of human contact. Okay, and that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Daniel. Wonderful presentation. Really enjoyed that. Um, Great, okay, well, our next speaker, uh, last but not least, is Natalie Burrell, who teaches French language and culture at the, at the Department of French and Italian at USC, as well as a seminar on representations of Paris in film and literature. Her research focuses on language pedagogy, the teaching of foreign languages, as well as Eric Romer's work. Um, and maybe actually, Natalie, maybe you could clear up something for me. Um, um, as okay, someone who's sure. tried to learn French over the years, uh, mm -hmm. I would say Eric Rome, but Rome, in English, Rome, 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 Rome. Rome. Okay, so it is, a, we do pronounce the R, good. Eric Rome, because that's all you ever hear, especially, you know, in the English speaking world is Romer. Well, Romer, I suppose, is what you hear most often. But, okay. Yeah. Uh, and her paper's title is Moral Choice in Tales of the Four Seasons by Eric Rome. Okay, I'm a little intimidated, I have to say, with the transition and, and uh, you know, Homer and uh, Han Haneke, and uh, <laughs> it's not going to be the same, but uh, anyway, I hope you will like it. Uh, so I'm going uh, to share. Uh, how do I share the screen again? I'm so sorry. No, uh, no, no problem at all. So there should uh, be Yeah, there you go. Okay. You see that down below? Okay, great. Yes. Now, are you sharing, Natalie, I didn't ask, are you sharing video or just your PowerPoint? So everything is in my PowerPoint. So I, Are there videos mm -hmm. in there as well? Yes, yes, a couple. So you might need to go and click on that share screen button again. Okay. Um, there should be an option. Let me see here. Um, you should see an option on the bar that says more. And if you click on that, Natalie, uh -huh. then you'll see something that says like optimize sound for- Optimize screen share for video clip. Perfect, okay. click that. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you for inviting me to your, to your panel. I appreciate it. So I just started um, some research um, on Eric Romer. Um, I've, um, it, it's been, um, um, I've, I've always uh, studied Romer, but I decided to really uh, focus on it. So it's, I'm at the beginning stage of, uh, of a question that I would like to develop a little further. Uh, but I have been teaching um, essentially uh, Romer and, um, and the French New Wave to my students um, in, in, gen in the context of general education courses. Uh, but I'm going to talk about um, the moral choice, uh, the question of moral choice, um, especially in, in, uh, in the aesthetics of Eric Romer, 
um, and I'm going to focus on the tales of the four seasons. Um, so, oops. So, in this presentation, I will talk about the theme of moral choice in Eric Romer's series, uh, Tale of the Four Seasons. I will briefly discuss how the tales are in line with the philosophy of cinema by explaining first how Romer's aesthetics define it and eventually the significance of moral choice or choices on the life of the characters as we, his audience, follow his characters' lives and become affected by their every move, their decisions and indecisions. The cycle of the tales uh, of the four seasons that he directed from 1990 to 1998 acknowledges the philosophical dimension of the theme of moral choice, a recurrent question in uh, uh, Romer's movies. So it's in this framework, I will therefore discuss how Stanley Cavell, the, um, I hope I pronounce it properly, uh, the American philosopher and other French philosophers and scholars have analyzed how Romer's work tests of the ordinary language philosophy and how his movies impact, um, impact us with uh, our moral choices. So for those of you, uh, I mean, it's not um, maybe the, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say, but, but if, you, if you're not familiar with Romer's work, he's an acclaimed movie director who belonged to the French new wave of the 60s, often called the camera stylo, um, camera pen, uh, as a means of personal expression. He started making movies in 1962, and he continued well after the, the new wave until 2007. His movies are essentially uh, created in cycles. For example, from 1962 to 1972, he directed the cycle of the six moral tales. Uh, and from 1981 to 1987, the cycle of comedies and proverbs. And from 1990 to 1998, the cycle of the, uh, of the tales of the four seasons, which is the object of this presentation. Um, he also did other, other movies. Um, shaped by um, André Bazin's realism, um, uh, um, Romer was also a writer and editor-in-chief for the renowned French film review Les Cahiers du Cinéma, as well as a literature professor and a writer, and most of his movies were adapted from his own writings. He was also influenced by the work of Murmo, the German ex with German Expressionism, uh, for whom he wrote his very first article, Cinéma, the Art of Space, his main written work, the taste, for, the taste of Beauty and The Celluloid and Marble discuss movies theories and how film relates to other forms of art, such as music, literature, and paintings. Um, and as I said earlier, he started making movies in the 60s and up until he directed his last movie in 2007 and he passed away in 2010. So um, to stick to the to the topic um, of the, the presentation and of the panel, I, um, I'm going to talk briefly um, uh, so what can philosophy of cinema teach us about moral choice? According to Cavell in the world viewed, cinema is a new beginning to moral philosophy because the knowledge provided by the experience of a movie is correlated to the knowledge we have about ourselves, about our ordinary lives. When we engage in a movie, we go through a process of what he calls skepticism, a process of many emotions such as doubts, refusal, and reconciliation and acceptance. Um, so um, he did write, um, so on, he, he wrote about uh, Tale of Winter because um, he, in his book, he, he discussed the Shakespeare's play. But he did say on Eric Romer's Tale of Winter, um, he writes, Romer's film um, has found its way of marking the intersection of contingency and necessity of chance and logic. So the initial question in the case of Romer's discoveries of his medium is, how, how has he found subjects, meaning persons and places and topics, that on film render the exploration of such ordinary questions of metaphysics or such uh, metaphysical questions of the ordinary representable and of continuous interest? Um, I want to talk about other, um, other people interested in, um, in Romer and, in, and obviously in the uh, philosophy of cinema. So uh, Sandra Logier, um, who's a, a prominent French scholar and a philosopher, um, they have analyzed uh, um, the work of Stanley Cavell and his legacy in the cinematic experience. 
uh, for, for French philosopher Sandra Logier, who was a former student of Cavell and a translator of some of his books, I, I believe. In her book entitled Stanley Cavell, Cinema and Philosophy, she, she says, quote, through mimesis, the screening of a movie is the answer to the ordinary conversation, and the success of its representation is the success of a skeptical interrogation. Um, she also said that the very finitude of the movie experience is the melancholic acceptation of separation of our condition. Here is the most profound lesson Cavell, Cavell is giving us, his way to show, that how, to show how cinema as well as philosophy is truly the education of adults. Um, others, other French philosophers and scholars, uh, as Elise Domenac, um, uh, on her talk on cinema and reconciliation, uh, based on Cavell's pursuits, uh, Cavell's pursuits of happiness, she says, quote, skepticism uh, means our difficulty to communicate with others, our doubts about others' feelings toward us, towards us, our difficulty to understand our environment and other people's emotions. Therefore, the mediation that the screen provides for us allows us to uh, recognize our skepticism in a projected reality to finally accept it. There is another um, uh, uh, major scholar in France and a philosopher called Hugo Clément who wrote Cinétique and, uh, and he, he also analyzed Romer, uh, Romer's work. Um, and on, in, in his talk uh, about thinking the intimate with the help of cinema, he says that there is truth in skepticism being that we are never sure to intimately, intimate, intimately know others we do not have access to their interiority, their inner selves, but we do not have access to our own interiority either, because the relationship we have with our own thoughts and emotions is not one of knowledge, rather it is one of recognition. Such recognition requires an effort to express, of expression from us, finding the right words to express ourselves, letting our own words unveil who we truly are. In this perspective, recognizing my own words and those of others as mine, observing a movie patiently and, and attentively, finding the words to describe the filming experience, bridges the, ab the abyss that separates us from ourselves, from others, and from the most ordinary things." End quote. Um, in his book entitled Cinetique, as I said, um, he discusses the ordinary moral life of uh, Romer's movie Winter Tale uh, that I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to show you um, a clip a little later on, and he explains explains how we are bound to be moved by the ending of a movie, by the ending of the movie, um, and we are moved by the character's destiny uh, in in Wind, uh, Tale of Winter, because as viewers, cinema pushes us to an ordinary experience. So I'm going to discuss right now um, the, the 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 tale of the tales of the four seasons from this uh, framework, and so the tales of the four seasons were made from um, it, it, it's, they are part of a cycle. Um, I, I am going to concentrate today just on the, um, for a question of time on a tale a tale of spring and tale of uh, winter, um, and um, um, so for for tale of for for winter tale tale of winter uh, rather narrates the story of Felicity. So it's it's her, and I'm just wondering if I no never mind. So so the the synopsis for 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 tale of winter narrates the story of Felicity's um, stunted life, who loses contact with the man she loves and with whom she ends up have she ends up having a child. Uh, having met during the summer, they go back to Paris, but sadly. She miswrites his address and loses contact with him for five years. So there's basically, um, instead of writing um, um, Le Val uh, Courbevoie, I think she writes Le Valois. So she completely loses um, his, uh, his contacts. Um, it is only after, uh, in the movie, it's, it's only after praying at church uh, and seeing Shakespeare's play with a, with, with a friend of hers, uh, The Winter's Tale, that she realizes she needs to search for Charles. She, she kind of has an, an epiphany. Then she makes the decision to leave. Um, sh she has two boyfriends in the story because um, Romer's, Romer's movies are kind of like a, a sketch and I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go back to it actually on his uh, aesthetics. Uh, there's always um, a skeleton with uh, one man and, and three women or 
th uh, one woman and three men. So anyway, she has two other boyfriends, uh, Loïc and Maxence, and she, she ends up leaving them. Uh, and she moves many times, there's, there's this uh, relation to space, um, from Paris to Nevers, and then from Nevers to Paris, and, and even she even moves within the city of Paris. Spring Tales um, uh, narrate the story of Jeanne, a philosophy teacher who is temporarily, temporarily without a space. So this is, again, this question of space. A, a pianist, Natasha, offers to, to, to host her and she accepts. The map gets complicated when Natasha's father and his girlfriend appear. The commutes to the country house, her boyfriend's apartment, and Natasha's house will clarify Jane's decision not to fall in love with Natasha's dad, who is interested in her. So I'm gonna, I'm, uh, right here. so here you can see um, a little bit of the, um, so this is Tale of Spring. This is Igor, um, um, Natasha, Jeanne here, and Eve, the girlfriend. And you can see um, that Homer is very careful with colors. Uh, and for the Tale of Spring, it's, uh, it's, it's white and green. The, the colors are white and green. In Tale of Winter, um, Felicie here and uh, Charles, so they met in the summer and they lost, uh, they lost track of each other and he doesn't know that she's expecting, a, she, that she had a, a daughter, uh, Elise, I think. Um, and you can see the, the contrast between the summer, the light and the winter. Um, so I'm going to show you um, a first uh, clip of um, of um, Tale of Spring, and please let me know if you can if you can hear everything. Can you hear? Yes, we can. Ok, thank you. Les avions détachés de la situation présente. Non, c'est en fonction d'elle que j'y pense. J'essayais simplement de me souvenir à quoi je pensais tout à l'heure quand j'ai dit oui. Quand c'est transcendantal Non, psychologique plutôt. Et alors Et en stade actuel de ma réflexion, qui a été brève, je pense surtout que je ne pensais à rien. Enfin, je veux dire, à aucun des motifs qui règle la conduite des êtres les uns envers les autres. Attraction, répulsion, amour, haine, domination, soumission, et tout. Je ne pensais ni à vous, ni à Mathieu, ni même à moi. Vous voulez dire que vous avez agi par automatisme Pas exactement. J'ai agi par logique. La logique du nombre. Celle du nombre 3. Mmh. Jamais vu ça. Oui, c'est un jeu. Il y a aussi toute cette tradition du nombre 3. Le triangle, le syllogisme, la trinité, la triade hegelienne, enfin, je ne sais pas. Toutes ces choses qui définissent un monde clos, qui instaure le définitif et qui donnent peut-être la clé du mystère. Mais je ne me sentais pas entraînée par une force extérieure. C'était par libre choix. J'ai vraiment agi par honnêteté envers la logique. J'aurais pu dire non, mais j'avais l'impression que c'était triché. C'était pas de jeu, comme je disais quand j'étais petite. Vous savez, c'était un peu la raison pour moi aussi. Un peu Oui, ce, ce n'était pas la seule. En fait, reste une personne en fonction de qui, ou plus exactement contre qui j'ai déterminé mon choix. Vous savez qui c'est Ce n'est ni vous ni moi. Ni notre fiancée au début. Eve Eh non, c'est Natacha. On venait de parler d'elle. Ok. So in this scene, um, the, the, we, we can see Igor and Jeanne, and um, they are, uh, Jeanne and, and showed up uh, unexpectedly to, uh, to um, Igor's house, and he met her through uh, Igor's daughter, uh, Natasha, and Igor has a girlfriend, he's divorced, he has a girlfriend, but he does fall in love with, uh, with Jeanne, and here in this conversation, um, she she explains to him her her ch the choice the choice of not um, uh, not uh, having a relationship with him. So 
here there's the story of the syllogism, the definite world, the logic uh, that that um, that end up ends up being uh, her decision. Um, I'm going to show you now um, the a scene of the tale of winter. Intervenez, madame, implorez votre mère à genoux. Chère reine, si votre père n'est pas retrouvé. Oh, mon Dieu, penchez-vous et versez de vos urnes sacrées une grâce sur le front de mon fils. Dis-moi, enfant, comment tu t'es sauvé Où tu vécu Et comment tu revins à la cour de ton père Car tu sauras que moi, Paulina m'ayant dit que l'oracle faisait espérer ton retour, <rire> j'ai voulu vivre encore afin de voir l'issue. Vraiment une prière, c'était plutôt une réflexion. Une méditation. Ouais, c'est ça. Tu sais, quand t'as l'esprit occupé par quelque chose, quand, quand on n'a pas bien dormi et qu'on a une décision à prendre, t'as une certaine excitation dans ta tête qui fait que tu penses beaucoup plus vite. Eh bien, j'ai ressenti ça, mais d'une façon mille fois plus forte. Brusquement, tout est devenu clair. D'une façon. Éblouissante Non. J'étais pas ébloui, je voyais au contraire très nettement. Qu'est-ce que tu dis Bien, c'est difficile à dire. J'ai pas pensé, j'ai vu. J'ai vu ma pensée. Tous les raisonnements que je faisais pour savoir si je devais partir ou pas partir, je les ai faits en un éclair. Et là, j'ai vu. J'ai vu ce que je devais faire, j'ai vu que je ne me trompais pas. Tu veux dire retourner à Paris mmh. Avant, je me cassais la tête pour choisir. Et là, j'ai vu qu'il n'y avait pas à choisir. Que je n'étais pas obligée de me décider pour quelque chose que je ne voulais pas vraiment. Tu vois ce que je dis, ça paraît banal, j'y avais déjà pensé. Mais ça ne me paraissait pas évident comme ça m'a paru tout à coup. Enfin, C'est dur à expliquer. Ok. So, um, Felicie, like I said, who... Um, uh, who lost track of her boyfriend, of Charles, um, uh, ends up uh, meeting him uh, just uh, by coincidence in Paris uh, five years later. And she, this happens with, um, um, she, she, she does two things. She, she decides to, to change her mind by going to, to church. Um, so she, there's the, the, the faith, uh, the faith that is, um, quite important in, in Romer's work, and also the patience um, that is based on her choice and the recognition. And this recognition is, is, uh, is made through uh, watching the, the theater play uh, Tale of Winter. So, um, so I would like to, to, to ask the question, how is the um, the ordinary experience present in 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 these two in these two scenes or in the in the tale of the four seasons. So um, his movies are made uh, in cycle or series, and the cycle of the tale uh, of the four seasons plays a variation on moral choices. And there are there are two points. Um, so his movies' aesthetics rely on the realistic aspects of his, of his visual style that you must have seen, the exterior movie scenes, the respect of the length of time, the avoidance of dramatic scenes and improvisation. Uh, the dialogues and the intrigues of, the, of his movies are linked by symmetries, coincidence, coincidences, paradoxes, both for the characters and the audience. Uh, there are two points that I would like to discuss further. It's time and space. For time, uh, to understand the, the tale of the four seasons is to elicit the police enemy of time. The tale um, of the four seasons is defined as time, um, as in the weather that is unveiling in the movies, a weather that is unpredictable and beyond our control. Cinema is an art that explores space and time. It can be the weather in the movie and the time that passes by, 
And the truth about cinema is to recognize our limits of time and space. We can assume the analogy that the limits of time can also be the limit of our choices given to us, which in turn can result in indecisions or refusal to choose. In Tale of the Four Seasons, the work of Homer is to figure out situations, to initiate and eventually to do the right choice, as in the Tale of Winter, for Felici, patience wins over resignation and despair. Um, in the article of uh, Romer's short stories, uh, da uh, David Vass, um, a French scholar and film critic, I believe, emphasizes how time or lack thereof uh, has an effect on the character's decisions, that which time becomes intertwined with space. In Rendezvous de Paris, the narrative consists in creating a parallel time among the characters. Uh, Vass, Vass, David Vass even, even talks about uh, the asymptote to define it this line that never really meets. Um, so that, bring us, that brings us to um, my, uh, my last point. Um, so space, um, this is too small. Okay. Uh, the, wor the words that Homer's characters cannot seem to live without are a constitutive part of their identity and of the spaces they, in they inhabit. It creates a complicated labyrinth of words and images in which the characters need to find their exit. The movement of the characters, their, space, their spaces, they move a lot in cars, trains, streets, they walk a lot in boulevards, reflect their moral choice or choices, their decisions and indecisions. Romer does, um, does, does so also by bridging their distinct, their distinct spaces, the landscape of Paris versus the countryside and the position of their relationships. Um, now I would like to talk about then the, the, the conflict, the, uh, not the conflict, but the, 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 what time and space share, the temporality. So it is within this temporality of time and space that the characters of the of the moral uh, the characters' moral choices evolve. So the narratives of the of the tale of the four seasons are somehow paralleled with the main character's narrative in the Garden of, of Forking Paths uh, by Borges, uh, Magali in Tale of Autumn, uh, Jeanne in Tale of Spring, Felicie in Tale of Winter, and Gaspard Tale of Summer are given choices that they first contradict to finally accept them. Or reject, them, or reject them, and in the case of Gaspar in uh, Tale of Summer, to let things unfold by themselves. The characters that, uh, can therefore change paths, paths providing them uh, space concurrently. Within that space, time will therefore multiply, offering many possible choices ahead. We can see that for, for Jeanne in Tale of Spring, time has allowed her to make a moral choice in her relationship, and it is because of the multiple spaces, uh, spaces, sorry, and the multiplication of time um, she ex that she experiences. Uh, um, I'm so sorry. The multiple time uh, space and the multiplication of time she experienced that she was able to do so. For Felicity in Tale of Winter, the space between the different cities that she lives in, the space that she relives while watching T Tale of Winter and time has convinced her to make the choice to search for her child's father whom she lost track with. So um, uh, as a conclusion, uh, I'm finishing here. Um, Natalie, Natalie, not yes. to interrupt, but I think we, I want to leave, I want to leave at least 20 minutes left, uh, 20 minutes for discussion. And I'm you, done. Um, you've gone close to 22 minutes. So I think I should cut you off if, if that's okay. I'm done. And yes. maybe we can, maybe during the Q and A, you can uh, share with us some of the, kind of summarize some of the thoughts that you had for the conclusion. Sounds good. Sorry, thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, thank you. I really enjoyed that. The, those are some really, it, it's reminded me, I've got to go back and watch. Uh, I, I think I've seen, I know I've seen summer and and winter, but I don't think I've seen uh, fall and spring. So I'll have to add those to my watching list. They're so profoundly philosophical. Um, uh, let's see, can you, yes. can you come out of the sharing for us? Thank you so much. Appreciate it, great. Well, um, so yeah, we have about 20 minutes, a uh, little, little less than that, but I guess Craig has told us that we can take a little bit longer since we're at the tail end of the, of the evening if we need to. Um, so yeah, so I think uh, participants can go ahead and, and chime in. Um, just make sure that you've unmuted yourself. 
uh, and you you can you know feel free to 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 use your cameras as well. Does anybody have a question to start us off? I, I do. I have a question for uh, for Daniel um, about you, and I I didn't catch what you said, but I, I thought it, the the light technique that is in uh, in winter light on uh, the the slide that says facial close ups. You talked about wax, but I'm not sure if I understood properly. Sorry, say that last part again. Winter light, the facial close-up. Uh, the the slide that says uh, whose title was facial close-ups. Mm -hmm. You talked about um, the light technique um, on one of the characters, yeah. and I, I just want I just wanted you to to um, just to to tell me again what what technique was used. I, I didn't catch that. It's it's such a it's such a strange moment in the film. I think it's one of the strangest moments in any film that I've ever seen. Um, so the priest has just realized that he no longer believes in God, and in that moment, light from the window, supposedly from the window, fills the frame, and everything gets very bright. But his face gets cast in darkness. So it's like this sort of epiphany, but at the same time, he's shaded in dark. So I think, I think what Bergman's doing there is using light um, rather than to show some kind of character change. It actually just confuses the meaning of the scene. It's a confounding use of light in the scene. And I suspect that's where the film gets its title from, which is winter light, which plays into the idea of uh, miscommunication and not being able to interpret signs properly. It just confounds meaning in the film. Thank you for asking. Can I can I ask you? Can you remind us a little bit about that? See, does he does he turn his? Is he facing out the window initially and then turn his back? And uh, do you remember? I, I remember the slide that you showed. I thought was fascinating because it almost looked as though the window had bars, and I have no idea if that's you know. I think he uh, he had just finished talking with one of his parishioners who is suicidal, and he doesn't really know why he's suicidal. Neither of them do. Um, and then the parishioner walks off, and Tomas, the priest, is sort of in his own world. He's not looking out the window. I think he's just staring towards the, vaguely toward the camera, um, kind of looking at nothing with that that five mile stare. Yeah. Thanks, Ananya. I think you had your hand up. Yeah, so um, I just want to say that I'm a big fan of Bergman and uh, I have kind of watched uh, even the most unimportant films. So one thing that I have noticed, and this is not related to psychoanalysis since um, I'm not quite acquainted with that. Uh, whenever he is talking about God, I think another theme that is almost recurrent in all his films is love or the absence of it. Because if I'm not wrong, in Through a Glass Darkly, it ends on that note where, uh, was it Corinne, Corinne's brother, who questions the father that, um, so what exactly is God? And then the father replies that uh, God is actually love. And then as we see the trilogy uh, progresses, uh, somehow the question of love becomes important because Martha is in love with the priest who does not reciprocate the feelings. And then in the third part, there is this bitter rivalry, as you also mentioned. So um, do you think Bergman reaches at some sort of uh, conclusion regarding this dilemma about uh, trying to understand what is religion and what is God, what is spirituality, um, if it has something to do with love or uh, desire, if you could comment on that? And also the different types of God that we see, for example, in Cries and Whispers, it comes in the form of a maternal refuge of Anna, the one who was comforting uh, this ailing woman. And in uh, Through a Glass Darkly, it's almost like a patriarchal father. So the very concept of God, which we uh, think of as a caring and loving father is disrupted because here we see that the God is a spider who tries to rape her. So, um, do you think that love or the absence of love has something to do with the religion, according to Bergman, or in your opinion? Thank you. Well, you're really well versed in Bergman. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it, it's hard hard for me to say. I think like one theme throughout Bergman's Bergman's work is the 
the stubborn insistence on love and hope in the face of God's silence in an indifferent world and the problem of evil, right? I do know in his later years, right before he died, he was talking a lot more about God than he ever had before. So I don't know if that suggests a conversion. Um, I haven't seen Fanny and Alexander. I refuse to watch it because it's the last masterpiece I haven't seen of his, and it would break my heart to watch it. <laughs> I like to know that it's still out there. So I can't really speak about his later films. But I, I do think, I think the trilogy insists, like I said in the paper, on the importance of human connection and maybe the importance of practice as a connection with other people, the absence of truth. I think Bergman respected the the philosophy of religion. Thank you for the question. No problem. Uh, and also uh, about Eric Romer, I have just seen one film. It's also a very short one. I think it's called The Bakery Girl of Mong Ho. And uh, you were talking about this uh, presence of one actor and two actresses, or sometimes it's just one lover and three beloved. So I think it was also there in that film where uh, this man was fascinated by a girl and then she disappears all of a sudden. And then he tries to pretend to fall in love with this other girl who was uh, working in the bakery. So, uh, so it's just an observation that the very yeah. dilemma and the question of moral choice is also there. Yeah, and, and he is. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. No, so uh, so this term of moral choice. I mean, if we look at the ending of that film, uh, he goes with that a woman he was in love with, but in between he has kind of broken the heart of the bakery girl. So when Aroma is using the term moral choice, is he like kind of, um, uh, you know, playing with the word also in uh, kind of presenting the immorality uh, reflected in the characters or uh, so why are they called the moral choice? Is it just because of the dilemma and the inconclusiveness of the choices? So... So the, it's an it's it's um it, it's an initial study that I'm doing that I'm starting, uh, but I am doing the, the the moral choice. I don't think that the characters of Eric Romer are immoral. I wouldn't call them immoral. No, there's never any. Um, they they are always boundaries within the the characters with with what they do. But in moral choice, um, I wanted to. Um, um, to talk about um, the, all his, his aesthetics um, impacts the, the moral choice. For example, you're talking about one man and, and three women, or um, there's always, uh, the, the situations are always intricate, always complex, because he's, uh, he's, he's, he loves architecture and he loves geometry. And there's always a part of, um, of that in his, um, in his narratives. You always have this, uh, this mathematical narrative mixed in it. And, um, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's how the, the choices uh, get complicated. But morally, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's my understanding of, um, of uh, you know, that, I mean, that's my approach, it's the aesthetic approach. But if you have another idea, I'm willing to listen to, uh, no, I have only I'm open to suggestions watched. because I'm just starting to study. Yeah, I've just watched one film, so I don't think that would be very ethical on my part to comment, right? So. so sorry, I have to go teach. I, I wish I could stay for longer. I have to teach in eight minutes. Thank you, Daniel. Really appreciate it. Thanks for being <laughs> Thanks here. so much for the questions. All right, take care. Bye. Bye. Ananya, I have a question about... Um, in, and maybe you stated this and I, I was just kind of toying with the technology for a moment, but I'm wondering how, where you come down on the relationship between Haneke's films and, and say Derrida's conception of, of hospitality. Um, I'm, you know, obviously Derrida's dri driving a lot of his, his, his ideas at that kind of later stage of his work from Levinas who talks about you know, respons radical responsibility involving a kind of substitution, an inversion. And you talked a lot about that, um, where the, the 
instead of being just responsible for the other, we become kind of the hostage of the other. And, um, and, and, it, and the, I mean, it, the points that you made, the connections you made were so like, once you made them, I, I don't think I had ever made them before, but once you made them, I was like, of course, yes. Like I was really, you know, I, it was fun, especially with cachet. Um, the, the, because that, that, that I, I enjoy funny games. I mean, to the, you know, enjoy, I think it's an interesting movie. Um, you know, you, you, you're, you're in some sense traumatized by it. I mean, it's almost as if the director's deliberately taking the audience hostage and, um, mm -hmm. going with us and, and torturing yeah. us in some ways. But, um, in Caché, if I'm not mistaken, the person, it's been a while since I've seen it, but I have seen it a couple of times. Um, the, the. It turns out, I mean, spoiler alert, uh, the person who's videotaping the, the, their house is, is the boy, um, Algerian boy who the family had kind of almost adopted at one point. And then, and then for some reason, um, if I'm not mistaken, they, um, it was yeah. uh, the main character, let's call it, let's say the main character who lives in the house, his parents mm -hmm. adopted mm -hmm. that child, right? Mm -hmm. and then yeah, that's point, right. Um, uh, he blamed a crime on that on that Algerian mm. boy, and he was mm. sent away to a to a um, uh, like a home orphanage, an orphanage, yeah. Um, and so there's a fascinating way in which, uh, by just viewing that home, the people living in it, you know, uh, become hostage to the camera, become hostage to the gaze of 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 of, of you know. The the yeah. But I'm wondering, but another way, because the in funny games. Obviously, the family that is taken hostage. I mean, it, it's true that when that main character, when the when the hostage takers break the fourth wall and say, "Oh, who are you rooting for?" I bet you're mm -hmm. on their side. Who do you expect mm -hmm. to win? You know that kind of thing. Um, you know what? What I'm just wondering what you think Haneke is saying. Do you think he's saying that? That I'm wondering if he's if he's in some sense rejecting this idea that more mm -hmm. responsibility requires us to become hostage to the other and to become the victim of a, of, a, of a violence. Um, is, is, is there not something, some third choice? Um, can't we be responsible without, in some sense, um, exposing ourselves to the violence of the other? Um, yeah, so um, I think uh, uh, since I've tried to link Haneke with Derrida, I would say that uh, when Derrida talks about this absolute hospitality, he says that it is paradoxical in nature because that which makes hospitality possible is also making it impossible in a way because when you are opening the doors to someone without questioning or just letting them in uh, you are in a way inviting a sort of violence uh, unwittingly because it is inherently present in that uh, absolute hospitality so um, in funny games, I mean, Manikel Haneke's approach to violence comes from the fact, as I mentioned in the post, that he was trying to critique the American audience who were uh, using violence in a more, uh, uh, let's say, they were consuming the violence through television and films. So uh, Haneke says that the only way to deal with violence is violence itself. So that is the reason he's trying to, you know, and he has been criticized by so many people that uh, on one hand you are trying to criticize violence but you are yourself using so many violent scenes so how are you trying to uh, kind of uh, negotiate that so i think his point is that we are all a part of this violent world we are already there we are always already embedded in this violence and even the participants it's not only the perpetrators even if we consider the family who came there it was the person, George, who started the violence first. He was the one to hit one of the boys. So the physical violence was started by him. It's not that they are not capable of violence. It's just that they are maybe wearing a facade of this bourgeois, uh, you know, uh, sentiments and so on, which is preventing them. So Haneke is coming from uh, a kind of place where he has witnessed the humanitarian crisis, the world wars, and so many things falling apart in the world which kind of shows that uh, we are all uh, capable of violence. And instead of enjoying violence through media, uh, maybe we need to put ourselves in their shoes and try to figure out if that happens. And I think the breaking of the fourth wall was also trying to drag the audience onto the film so that they can be a participant. And I think the choice is important because Peter says that you can you are on their side, aren't you? Which means you can also be on our side. 
So this choice kind of uh, leaves the audience in a position where they can be either with the perpetrators or uh, with the victims. Um, yeah, Hanukkah I, I actually has a series of interviews where he talks about this violence uh, in different journals and stuff. So one point that becomes recurrent in this interview is this, that he wants to kill violence with violence. And, um, and there's also one thing different about him. He's not exactly showing violence on screen. If uh, you notice, all his violent scenes are just, uh, for example, when the boy is killed, it's not shown. It's the blood that is splintered on the television. So um, he says that he wants the audience to kind of have some sort of expectation or hope about what happens uh, when violence is created. So he leaves it up to the audience, to their imagination. Uh, so that's a way of handling uh, his violence and uh, these tropes, these technological tropes like camera, television, and all these things, they kind of uh, become instrumental in bringing the violence to your home, the home which is supposed to be your safe space, and uh, turns out it's not. So, yeah, interesting. Well said. I think the that's whereas you know if it, if it's a critique of of Hollywood cinema, let's say American okay. Hollywood cinema, where violence is a set, it's not just aestheticized in the classical sense um, such that it becomes a cathartic thing. It's, it's, almost, it's almost just made, it's, it's just made sheer entertainment. It's made trivial. And, and, um, and I feel like that, you know, Funny Games is, is, is a movie where you experience violence in such a way that you genuinely feel violated and, you, and it makes you kind of, dis it makes you disgusted. No one leaves the theater feeling happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know, um, you feel like you've been traumatized, you've been violated, and and so you experience the the dark side of violence, which is what's kind of you know quote unquote whitewashed mm -hmm. in Hollywood cinema. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that uh, uh, responsibility, the problem of responsibility, is being kind of this uh, um, auto deconstructive paradoxical concept where the conditions mm -hmm. of its possibility are also the conditions of its impossibility, and so on and so forth. I have a question for you, Natalie, actually on that same point because I think that's what that's what Derrida says about a decision right he says at least again like in in, in writings from like the 80s and 90s he says that undecidability is the condition of possibility for making a genuine decision if you can if you can simply weigh the pros and cons and make a decision on that basis then it's not a genuine decision then it's just a mere calculation any computer could do that you just feed it right. the inputs and it will spit out the answer so genuine human decisions um, can only be made under circumstances where the pros and cons can't, you know, they they can't be weighed in this in this particular way. So it has to be undecidable. Um, I guess I, I want to ask you about contingency, especially in a winter's tale, um, or sorry, a tale of winter. Uh, yeah, um, that's interesting. The, the yeah, translation I, I is interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So go tale ahead. of winter, tale of winter. winter. He changed yeah. it. Yeah. So I'm sorry. Go ahead. What's your question? No, I just about... well it, the. Contingency plays such an important role in that particular film because, again, you know, actually, this well, we let's just say because I know Ananya hasn't seen it for you know this film, so I don't want to spoil it for it because it really is it's a fantastic movie. I think I've seen probably about ten of his movies. I think it's probably it's, my favorite. it's moving, yeah. Um, it's a wonderful movie, but let's just and say Claire, that, Claire's knee too, but and Claire's knee is wonderful too. Yeah, but way, I don't know if I would show that right now, but yeah, yeah. By the way, watch it again. <laughs> the, the Denver Film Festival just ended, and there was a, a film. Um, by a, a, a Israeli director called Ahed's Knee, uh, which is a clear homage. I, I mean, in, ter oh. at least in terms of the title to Claire's Knee. But anyways, um, the, uh, the question I was going to raise though is that contingency plays such an important role, chance plays such an important role in the final moments of that film. Um, it seems to kind of explode the, 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 the in some sense it, it, it uh, it, it, it almost negates the moral crisis that, that the, the main female protagonist is having, right? Because, because had, you know, without this chance happening, um, her, her, what well, with this chance happening, her crisis has gone away in some ways, right? Like yes. she's no longer, there's no longer a decision to be made in some way. Right, ways. right. Um, and, uh, I guess um, where am I going with this? Yes, so but I, it, but the, the 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 end of the movie doesn't say what's going to happen after. That's so. true. That is true. So that the way it films the the very last scene is just I'm not going to spoil it for for Ananya, but it's not a place of uh, 
it's not a setting that that tells the the, the viewer that something is uh, stable. Yeah, that's in, true. In that's my true. understanding. Yeah, yeah. It um, also paints. I've never seen Paris more cold and wet and snowy than. I mean, he really makes Paris feel miserable in that in that movie. I mean, it's, it's yeah. as cold of a winter as you can imagine in Paris. Anyways, yes. um, any questions from the audience? I see. Uh, I've got. Uh, let's see here. Trip is on on the line. I can see his face. He's the only audience member whose face I can see. But maybe. Um, let me scroll here a little bit. Oh <laughs> well, well, I had a question, uh, yeah, Mary. I, when um, I'm sorry, uh, when the person, I'm sorry, the first person that spoke about the film, right there. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's uh, I kind of don't know if I'm saying your name correctly, Ananya. Is yeah, that that's right. right. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, when you were um, explaining in your comments about the choice in funny, funny games, which I haven't seen, and I want to see lots of these films, but I have seen all of Bergman's films, but <laughs> decades ago, uh, and I and I, but this is a different question. You were saying the choice uh, that th this is meant for an American audience, and it was so sad that you know, as a German a filmmaker didn't come here because during the 90s, that was the choice. Either you're with us, you know, this idea we got from uh, the 80s and 90s, either you're with us or you're uh, against us. In other words, uh, that kind of a false dilemma that's in the American uh, cultural mindset has caused many wars, you know, <laughs> meaning there's a, this stark choice, you know, Right yeah. or wrong, you're either with us or against us, and that applies to all the terrorism and and et cetera. And I think um, that needs to be addressed, right? Is what you were yeah. saying. I, I think we have more, and and that's what the uh, moderator, yes, was saying. That we must have more choices than you're with us or against us, mm -hmm. right? And and it's yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's beyond that. Uh, even uh, with Natalie, it's not about a good choice or a bad choice because. <laughs> Like it's clearly not black and white, then there's a lot of spectrum in between. So that's true. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, yeah. In other words, the paradox is more is much more subtle in the film than than that statement, either you're with us or against us. You know. Uh, yeah. in other words, they're switching sides in the movie. Yes, thank you. I I guess that, that increases the tension to a certain extent <laughs> yeah. when you are just, you know, making such sharp choices that you have to be either with me or with them. Yeah. So, yeah. It's hard to be either one of those choices. In other words, we're both of them and, and neither in a way is what you were saying. I think mm -hmm. he's trying to communicate. It's not like, it's not really like that to make it mm. that stark or because you're flipping like a, a yin yang type flip there with the opposites. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's one and the same thing in reality. Is that yeah. what you were trying to say? Like, there's really, where's the wall between us that we're breaking through and, and coming mm. together there? I'm not... Yeah, I think it's more like uh, participating uh, into the action than taking sides, but uh, the binaries yes, yes. have been working in a way uh, in the film because uh, there are a lot of choices that they give and especially you have to choose a game. Uh, so Peter goes on giving them choices. You can either play this or play that and uh -huh. turns out that both the results will amount to their death or their murder. So they're not really choices. It's just that the destination is going to be the same. It's just the instrument of the choice varies. So I think it talks about more uh, how the tension is built up through this, uh, you know, suffocation and the claustrophobic uh, ambience that is being created through these sharp divisions. Hmm. But yeah, I get your point. Yeah, I think that's a good observation. Well, thank you for your comments. And, and for Bergman, uh, about the facial close-ups now, in my memory and cries and whispers, was that with the mother and son uh, um, story and, and the looks on the face of the mother, uh, the famous actress, I thought they did convey a lot at that time when I, when I saw it, when it came out or after it came out at some point, maybe in the 70s or 80s is when I, 
I viewed Bergman's films. And I do remember in Cries and Whispers, there was more expression than I saw in Tomas, uh, you know, the pastor. And I just mm -hmm. was wondering about the Cries and Whispers. Uh, I uh, think yeah. you mean to say the silence because Cries and Whispers was about these three sisters who were... Oh, okay, that's not the one then. Where's the one where, where the mother has this difficult relationship about the son? Uh, um, is it Autumn Sonata? Uh, for, I don't remember. Thank you. I, I, I mean, they were so long ago. I need to look at more of them again. Uh, yeah, it's a famous... Uh, famous actress, a female actress, and it's a mother-son, a uh, very disconnected uh, attachment to that in that film. Is that it? Uh, Autumn Sonata, maybe? Autumn Sonata is the disconnection uh, between the mother and the daughter, so no, I don't see a son there. Okay, I guess, I guess I'm con uh, it was a while ago. I'm going to find that out then. Thanks for correcting me, but but didn't you think in, in that one, uh, there was lots of expressions on these family relations and on the mother's face, at least the fi the, the the female actress. Uh, was that Ingrid? I don't know. I don't know. Lee Woolman. Yeah. Oh, love my well. I don't know now. Yeah, I thought she was conveying a lot with the facial. I mean, when he honed in on her, but I'm not sure now. Do you remember that one as well? I don't. I mean. <laughs> There's so many I, I wish, haven't I wish seen. Danny were still around. He might. He might be able to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't you know. Um, um, any Any other questions or comments okay. that? Uh, um, no. Um, I'll only I, say that I, I I found your presentations fascinating and they made me think a great deal. But I don't have particular questions right now. So, but I want to thank you for for your presentations very much. Thank you, Trip. Thank you. Yeah, I um, and I I second that. These were really it was a fantastic uh, group of of presentations, and it's really made me want to go back and watch, um, watch some of these movies that I haven't seen in in quite a while. Um, they, I mean, they really are three of of of, of the all time greats, I think. Um, so Emma, I see your face. Do you have a comment or question before we close the session? No, I was just um, thankful for your presentations. I really liked um, uh, just the visuals and the philosophical application. Um, I think those, um, my, my question would have been for, um, uh, he laughed, I forgot his name. Um, uh, Danny. Then Danny, because I liked what he talked about with the conversations that don't go anywhere and um, and those pauses. But but I think all of your, all of your essays were very good and, and thank you. Yeah, they're great, they're great. Um, well, thank you guys, and thank you, thanks to the to the folks who attended the session too. I really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. I know there's a lot a lot going on, Pamela and otherwise. So uh, very kind of you to join us. So round of applause to everybody for participating. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think this this video will go up eventually on the DeFi website. There's a Craig might have another place. Pamela might have a a, a, a website for this as well. But our our website is, um, I'll, I'll try to type it here if I can. Uh, let's see. And we do, we do a lot of film, mostly film and philosophy, but not always just film and philosophy. We do a lot of uh, film events with the Denver Film Society here. In fact, we just got done doing um, a couple of panel discussions at the Denver Film Festival, which concluded just last night. It's a two-week international film festival. It's quite, it's quite something actually for a city of the size of Denver. And uh, we did one on one panel on this Ahed's Knee film uh, by uh, a director who I, I'm blanking on his name. He's an Israeli director who made the movie Synonyms that was kind of a highly acclaimed film. I think. It, oh, I think um, I've watched that. Uh... Was it about a guy who moves to a different place? And, yeah, uh, an Israeli who moves to Paris. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which I, I bring up in part because it Poster might be- the guy in yellow color coat and uh, yes. he was like, yes. doing something like this. Yeah, yeah I, I yes. don't remember the director, but yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Nadav, I think is his name, perhaps yes. Nadav. Yeah. Um, and um, so that, and then there was also, we did a panel on a, on a South Asian documentary uh, entitled A Night of Knowing Nothing. Uh, Ananya, have you happened to see, did you see that by chance? It it won best documentary at the um, Cannes Fortnite Film Festival, 
Uh, so it's very no, maybe not yet. Uh, yeah, but it's very, it's very playful. It's really interesting. Um, I'd be curious to to know what you think of it. It it deals a lot, especially as a student in in India right now. It deals a lot with, um, you know, Modi and. Oh, and I think my friend in US watched this. I think it has a lot with student protests and uh, really, the fascist yeah. regime. Yeah, she was talking about it. Yeah, and the the documentary makes it. It's it's kind of. It, I would say it's a genre bending documentary. It's not what you would, if you want to get your a grip on Indian mm -hmm. contemporary Indian politics, mm. it's probably not the best place to start. It presupposes a lot and doesn't really provide a lot of information. But one of the things that it it um, suggests is that, that I don't know, that Modi's administration has been appointing, um, you know, Hindutva friendly, you know, basically religious nationalists to different yeah. The, uh, positions at universities across India, which honestly it sounds a, a lot like a lot like how things stood here in the states under under Trump. Trump. Uh, but of course, Trump didn't have the power to to do that. Although plenty of republic, plenty plenty of of, of uh, governors do. I, I won't say anything else because I shouldn't <laughs> be recording it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Now I get fired. I'm kidding. I'm I'm I'm, I'm full <laughs> professor. I can't. They can't fire me. So I'm just kidding. <laughs> It's what about things about American, you know, at least as long as it lasts, we'll see. Um, what about um, I've been trying really hard, by the uh, way. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, what was that? I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I can't resist bringing up the Korean film, The Parasite, in relation to what um, mm. uh, was about the guest. <laughs> the, yeah, and, uh, right. The, yeah. Ah, I mean, I, when you were speaking, I kept the first thing I kept thinking mm -hmm. was the Korean great filmmaker and that won the best picture that year just a year ago yeah. isn't it similar yeah <laughs> absolutely way? so yeah. they're also yeah. invite a group of people and then yeah. the things go all topsy turvy so yeah chaotic awry totally awry yes and violence uh, unexpected mm -hmm. violence mm -hmm. at the end that was shocking to me yes yeah yeah Actually, there are many films to think of that way. I mean, this uh, hospitality and uh, home outside, this can be traced, I guess, in a number of films. Yes. So that's a great theme. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Well, really a pleasure meeting all of you. Thank you so much for joining the panel yeah. and um, for those wonderful papers. And yeah, hopefully we stay in touch. So, you mind if I take a group selfie before we leave? Is of that allowed? Not. Of course. I, I don't know what a group selfie is, but go for it. <laughs> Send it to us. Okay, let's see. So it's just going to be a screenshot, I guess. Screenshot. Yeah. yeah. Screenshot. And then yeah. shift command three. Great, thank you. Would would one of you send me that? So, because I I don't I'm not techno I'm like a luddite I'm not technologically savvy, so I have no idea how to do it. But please do. We'll post it to our. To our, uh, uh, so how to get in touch with you are you like you on uh, <laughs> is it the website that you sent yeah i'm gonna i'm just gonna put my email here so everybody has it okay yeah oh i think i already have it because you had been yeah, I think you did sending email, us. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah natalie you, you do as well mm -hmm. uh, but for the other folks um you know in case in case you're looking if you if in a couple weeks time there's something you want to you know watch in one of those presentations we hopefully will have that up by then so you can come back and look at it so well thank you all really appreciate it this is really fun Hi, thank, thank you, you. Thank, yeah. you. Thank, thank you very bye. much thank you very much bye bye, bye. bye. thank you bye.